Somebody made a Carmilla radio play? Tell me more. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have the very exciting opportunity to talk to not only the creator but the cast of the Carmilla radio play running on YouTube. And this is a this is a real fascinating project that uh, I've kind of been watching now for a month or two, actually ever since I finished doing my episode on Carmilla. So this I think makes for a wonderful follow-up to see what some artists are doing with this material. So today, we are joined by the cast and creator of Carmilla. And uh, I'll just kind of go through and call you out one at a time by name. And if you could just tell me what it is that you have to do with the project and uh, uh, just a little bit about yourself. And David, since you're the creator, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, okay, uh, my full name is David McDowell Blue. Uh, I'm mostly a theater critic and playwright. Uh, big vampire aficionado. I've also adapted Dracula, by the way. Excellent. Shameless plug. Uh, and I wrote uh, the script to Carmilla the radio play, mostly out of a sense of frustration. I don't like in one way or another. I see serious problems with pretty much every other adaptation, things I didn't okay. like. And... Um, I uh, am, in effect, the producer, also the director, and the sound editor. Which okay, it's a lot is, of hats. You know, yeah, uh, I used to be a blonde. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should also say I'm also the editor of the annotated Carmilla, which is available on Amazon.com. Second shameless plug, uh, and um, <laughs> so I, I can, I feel fully qualified to say I am an expert on this story. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And and you've assembled an excellent cast here. Let's let's find out who these guys are. So, uh, in no particular order, but based on how you guys are arranged here in my Zoom window, uh, Dorothy, let's start with you. I'm Dorothy Lighty. I'm a Britborn actor, I'm currently based out of Ireland, and I played Madeleine de la Fontaine. All right. Kathy? I'm Kathy Bell Denton. I'm currently in Los Angeles. I'm an actor, audiobook narrator. I played Laura's governess, Madame Peridon, associate to Madame de la Fontaine. All right. Brittany? Hi, I'm Brittany DeLeon. I'm based out of LA, and I play Laura Bennett. Excellent. Steffi? Hi, I'm Steffi Kame. I'm California based. I'm in. A voiceover actress as well as a mercy theater actress and creator and i play carmilla all right and lastly paul i am paul carpenter i'm an actor and a retiring writer and i play bennett laura's father excellent excellent okay well thank you guys for being here and uh and being willing to uh to, to talk a little bit about this show um so the first, the first thing that, uh, that we should probably discuss is, is the format. So David, this is, a, this is a, a radio play in pretty much every sense of the word, but it's up on YouTube. Uh, can you talk to us for a minute about sort of what the process was for, for coming up with, uh, with that approach? Part of it was that uh, is a direct response to the pandemic. Okay. Uh, simply that I wanted the, as I've uh, described it, that the script is set up so that it can be done as a Zoom performance, as an audio performance, or as a live action radio play on stage. Okay. Um, did it as an audio show because that's the cheapest way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the money saved on costumes and sets alone. <laughs> sure, you know, sure, the sure. Theater, the theater rental is nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's, the lighting right. is, you know, it's up to the individual person and it really doesn't matter. They can do it in the dark if they want. <laughs> because <laughs> it's all in the sound. And um, 
uh, because I wanted to get it out there. I wanted very much to, and something to do creatively during the pandemic. My background's in theater and uh, so is all these lovely people. So that's a way to do it. And it's very cheap. <laughs> and so, and you know, it's uh, the electronic uh, 21st century equivalent of, hey, I've got a barn, AKA a desktop with Audacity and Zoom. Let's put on a show. Excellent, excellent. So, did did you guys uh, record this uh, all together live, or did each person sort of record their own lines and then send them to you, and David, you edited them together? There was extensive editing on David's part. He was too <laughs> modest just now. He, the visuals he added were wonderful, and he took care to direct us as an ensemble. Now, there were times where, okay, make sure we build in some pauses, so in case we need to cut, but we were definitely acting with each other, to each other, reacting to each other. So That's we excellent. rehearsed and we, and we did it more than one time. Um, and we didn't, hear our, we didn't hear any of the sound effects. So we were told what, what the atmosphere was and where there might be space for it. And David made all that magic happen on his own. Gotcha, gotcha. And so uh, for, for you guys and I who must are... emphasize how much wonderful effort all these folks put into the rehearsal process. It, it, this was a very long rehearsal process, even for a, if it was a live stage show. And, how long uh, was the rehearsal process? Shows. About 10 weeks. That would be about right, yeah. Was this a uh, was this a situation where you guys would meet uh, once or twice a week for like an hour or two, or was this like an everyday kind of rehearsal schedule? I mean, for some, for some wasn't everyday. For oh. some, you know, uh, I had conflicts, and you know, another uh, castmate had conflicts, and so we had to record individually and then you know come together at the end. But yeah, I mean, and time zones was a thing. I mean, our colleague Olga in Eastern Europe as well, bless her. I was up at two and three in the morning. She was up nearly having her breakfast. <laughs> oh, wow. She's in Russia. She's in Russia. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, uh -huh. further than, yeah, further than yeah. Eastern yeah. Europe. And, and so, uh, so how, how was it uh, for you guys uh, sort of performing this all together from all these disparate locations? What, 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 was, what was the experience like? I think most of us by this point had had a fair amount of Zoom experience. And I was in The Show Must Go Online, which included actors from, I think, four different continents simultaneously doing Shakespeare. Wow. So we were able to adjust. I mean, you build in extra time for overhead because internet, because dogs barking, because plane going overhead, stuff like that, usual things. Mm -hmm. gotcha, gotcha. I would say also the major part of the process that was, uh, I think, most helpful was that to mention to people the specifics of where they were. Yeah. And exactly their position. Um, uh, to various degrees. Brittany had the lion's share of having to do that because uh, she's really the narrator character. Right, right. And um, playing Laura, just like the novella. Um, and for scenes between her and Carmilla, i.e. Steffi, uh, a lot of more details were worked on of things like exactly where were they sitting? How close were they to each other? Uh, sometimes, what can you see? from where you are, which impacts, uh, like, what's your tone of voice? Things like that, whether you know you, you want anyone to hear you or things like that, yeah. I, I have this note and I still have it in the back of my script and I'm keeping it alongside the, this is not a natural British inclination to go and get the tea. The other one I have is it's the drawing room, the curtains are heavy. And I just uh -huh. love that as a note that that's, yeah, yeah just, just it was, even though it was over Zoom, it was very much rehearsed and blocked out like a stage play, yeah. um, which was, I think, why it was so easy to to do it because we could really, uh, we knew our block, I knew exactly how close I was getting. I knew to lower my voice if I was close to someone or to raise it and 
um, like those little details about how heavy the curtains are, where, what time of day it is, what the light looks like, what am I wearing? <laughs> um, really, which is important in one scene, but anyway. But yeah, so even though it was over Zoom, it was very, very tactile in a way. It's so cool, isn't it? Because there's this kind of two competing views over the last two years of Zoom. There's the kind of the, it can't be done, <laughs> get back on stage. And there's the other lot, um, which would be more my camp, which is more like, hey, this is, you know, the biggest development in theatre since we got off of Gaslight. This is like new, you can do a lot. <laughs> and it's kind of to be on the, yeah. you know, kind of uh, plug that in there, see, does that work? Kind of, nope, <laughs> do it that way. That's brilliant. And there's a That's bit of it. There's a bit of a, um, a parallel how something happened that Steppy mentioned at one point when I played for her and Brittany a scene uh, that we'd gotten we'd gotten a certain scene we, it was nailed it was nailed so I had that audio recording and I put the sound effects in and I send that scene to them and something Steffi said to me after she was amazed at how totally immersive it was and I knew that she was involved in a lot of immersive theater uh, plug coming she's actually has a one-woman show going on now where she is uh doing Sylvia Plath. I've already seen it or heard it, experienced it. And uh, I wrote a review, a very positive one. She does a brilliant job. And I think maybe that's one, the fact that that was her background, that that helped her totally immerse herself into being this vampire in this particular world, in this particular place, which she knocked out of the park, really. Thank All you. right, that's excellent. <laughs> so, so let me. So we'll we'll get back to we'll get back to the the acting experience here in a minute. But but David, tell me how how exactly did you go through and cast for this? Because you have you obviously have you know actors from all over the world who are participating in this. So how did you find these lovely people? Um, I actually had auditions online via Zoom. Um, and to be sure, I had several people in mind that I already worked with at one time or another. Being a theater reviewer here in Los Angeles, one of the largest theater communities on earth, I have, I personally know a huge pool of actors. That would make sense. And in fact, uh, Brittany and I are members of the same theater company. Okay. And I've known Steffi for years. Okay. Um, uh, Dorothy, I got to know through some other, but it, it's lovely how I got to know, uh, you know, knowing her and it's all this. But the point is that uh, I put the uh, auditions to Paul, I know from an audition from a previous reading of a play I wrote, and uh, which was a lovely bit of serendipity because <laughs> the audition was specifically calling for non binary or transgender actors. And he didn't quite notice that. He thought I was casting for all the parts. Uh, he showed Excellent. up and I said, well, sure, let's have the audition. And I cast him in another part. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. And then I used him again. He's a very good actor. So um, but auditions. And then I partially had to just look at people's schedules and things of seeing um, that um, it's one of the reasons. I mean, Olga was absolutely magnificent. I might have well have cast her in another part except she's in Russia, and I just couldn't imagine doing that to her. So I had to give her a small part to let her have as much sleep as possible. Because yeah. <laughs> it's just so far away. Um, and likewise, you know, so it's, and like all, every practically every set of auditions I've ever had, you grab some, you find some gems, and you find other people who for one reason or another don't work. And you're usually left with some holes and you go and ask uh, the actors, you know, if they would, hey, would you be interested in doing this? Here's what's interested. Here's the schedule and stuff. Da, da, da. And um, that is a pretty ordinary audition process of casting of a show. The tricky thing was how many characters there were. Gotcha. And how many characters do you have? Ten. Okay. All right, because yeah, including thinking... a radio announcer, because oh, it sure. is a radio show, 
Yeah, sure, sure. And that was that was something that I really because uh, and and we'll we'll talk about the sort of the the episodes in a second, but. Uh, the first episode is up on YouTube, and uh, so I, I watched slash listened to that, and I love the fact that you came up with your own radio station uh, mm-hmm. that uh, is broadcasting it. Uh, and so, so where, so what, what made you decide to do that that little touch? There is a tension in the original that we do, we as a modern audience do not perceive because it's not part of our world. The setting of Carmilla is Austria. Uh, in, uh, I would argue certainly in the 1840s, there are internal clues that any current time would have said, oh, that's the 1840s. Um, but of course, at the time it was published was 1871. At that time, Austria was widely regarded accurately as a police state. So trying to convey that is tricky um, but at the same time not only making yeah we make in in this particular script yeah the austrian empire is portrayed as not at all a nice place to live but uh, especially in terms of personal liberties um, and if you are a deviant in any way but also ha- you have to try to somehow make that not of simply the past And it seemed to me, since it's going to be a radio show anyway, and we should have this introductory thing. And by the way, for the live for live action, if anyone wants to put this on live action, there is a prologue and an epilogue about the actors coming together and meeting at the radio station and stuff. And then as they leave. And so I wanted to make uh, a dark comedic commentary via the radio announcer, because if you're going to have this sort of thing and break it up in acts. Among other things, you had, there, there's this old saying, uh, actually, it's not an old saying, but David Gerald, uh, who wrote The Trouble with Tribbles for Star Trek, once made a very good point in something he wrote, said that you know every single show is hopefully there for artistic reasons, but the commercials are there to sell soap. So, and therefore, it's inherently jarring. And the more jarring it is, the better is the show. <laughs> so <laughs> I say it would be kind of nice if the jarring was used to a dramatic purpose. I and see. that's what I was trying to do. And to make it a bit more uh, obviously topical. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, so this, uh, forgive me for asking this question, but it, 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 it was jarring when I listened to it and Almost the first thing out of the announcer's mouth was, uh, on this radio station, we tell, you know, tales of the gothic and macabre through a Christian lens. And I was like, oh, wait, what am I getting into here? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so, so the question that I'm asking, because I've only, I've only uh, listened to the first episode, is, is that meant to be sort of like, it, like diegetic, like within the meta world of this radio production? Or is yes. that like actually like you're like oh no or, I here is I thing. love Jesus here's and we're gonna we're gonna look at this uh, through Jesus's eyes. It's okay. Yeah, I love Jesus. I am a Christian, but that doesn't mean I'm right wing. The uh, I'm yeah, that's another whole scam. Yeah, my point was <laughs> though that it's a commentary that the producing organization of W O D N. There's a hint right there. Uh, but uh, doesn't understand the show they're putting on. Okay. It is part of the dichotomy that I have always seen with Carmela of people not seeming to realize what it's really about, including some people. And one of my favorites is that um, there's one, the commentator who once noted there's a section where Laura describes being fed upon by Carmela. And she says it's like cold water trickling over her breasts and that she felt her heart beat faster, faster. And suddenly she was breathing harder. And then she suddenly felt a huge relief and fell into a languorous sleep. And I love this little footnote says, is the funniest thing in the world as people read, you know, 
commentators trying to pretend this is anything other than an orgasm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, people do that. I say people have said, there's no lesbianism in Carmilla. Ooh. I've had people look at me and just look at me in the face and say that with absolute sincerity. And, and which, so I wanted to bring that dichotomy on stage, as it were. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Fascinating. Well, okay, so let's, let's uh, talk real quick. Uh, Steppy and Brittany, tell me about, so you're, you guys are playing the two lead characters of this very well-known story that has had multiple adaptations for, you know, 200 years now. H how did you guys approach this material for this particular production? Steffi, I'll let you start. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I first read Carmilla in college at San Francisco State University. I took a class called the Vampire Tradition, and it's just oh, about why did we have that class? Where I, I went to know. <laughs> I had I didn't really know much about vampires before then. I just took this elective, like why not? And oh my god, it was amazing. And one of the texts we read was Carmilla, and I fell in love. It was so good. And then two years later, I moved to Los Angeles and I met David. And the very first conversation we had was about Carmilla. I don't even know how we got onto that topic, but like the first night we met, we talked about how much we love Carmilla. And um, then seven years go by and he puts it up again and I audition and got it. And it was really cool, kind of a dream role. Um, so I'm very aware that Carmilla has a lot of people who love People love Carmilla. I love Carmilla. So I came first and foremost from just being a fangirl and wanting to do her justice. And what I really love about this adaptation, and I've said this before, and I will always say it, is Carmilla's in this adaptation, not just this one note villain of like, I'm an evil vampire because I'm evil. Ooh, like there's so much <laughs> story to her and so much character and depth and sadness. Oh my God, the amount of times when we recorded <laughs> when I would finish a scene and I'd go really quiet and be like, Steppy, and I'd be like, I'm just crying for Carmilla, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we really brought so much to to it. So it's not just like, I'm gonna bite you now, ha ha. It's, it's, it's just, there's so much to Carmilla. There's a story there, there's a history there. And so coming from a place of a lot more, I guess a sympathetic approach, it's more interesting, it's more fun. I think it was more fun for me to play and I think it's really fun for people to listen to. Um, so I came at it from, a, from an angle of who, like, why, how did Carmilla get here? What is, what's, what's going on with her? Where, where, what's her history? Because at that point she's been alive for 200 years, alive. She's been around for quite a <laughs> while and there's, that just means there's a lot to explore. It was very, very detailed work of bringing this character to life. And it was awesome. Yeah, I mean, so my history is a little shorter than seven years with Carmela. Um, <laughs> I first got into it with the web series and just fell in love with just the whole story and how they shot it and, you know, just in general. So I went to uh, read a little bit of the, the novel um, and I was like, okay, cool. Like, I like this, but Laura is just kind of, you know, I didn't like jump at the opportunity when, you know, auditions happen, then, you know, things happen like, you know, life. Um, so I, but when I read David's interpretation, I was like, oh my God, like Laura is this, like, you know, she's just like this fire pit, like just ready to like explode. And um, that's what gravitated, you know, that's what pulled me in uh, for David's ad adaption or whatever. And um, yeah, words right now, guys, not the best. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it was, it was, uh, I'm still thinking about some scenes, um, but it was really nice. That's all I got to say. That's cool. Right that's cool. And I, uh, I mean, I, 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 I certainly sorry. appreciate the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the book, the book is, the book is the book. It was written, you know, at a very different time, uh, you know, by a straight white male author. Uh, and, so the character of Laura can be uh, it just a bit of a kind of one note sort of fainting lily. Um, yeah. So, so I'm just curious, like, how, like, uh, 
What did, uh, apart from David's interpretation, like what did you feel like you needed to inject into the character to fill it out? Well, I mean, the other interpretations I've seen with Laura is very, again, like one note and very just like, I don't know, kind of a whiny person. Um, and here, I mean, other than David's words, right, which played a big part into it, um, it's just that she, there's so much more to her. How can there not be? She's in this crazy castle alone, you know, with two older women. And then randomly this girl comes in and she's like just taken aback and her whole life is kind of turned upside down. Um, how can you play that, you know, that character one note? Um, there's just, there's so many things, you know, she's constantly thinking and she's constantly just like on top of like just her thoughts, you know what I mean? Like her, her imagination is coming true. And uh, yeah, so that's a lot of that, you know, came into the acting portion and um, really blocking everything out with Steppy and David. Uh, it was kind of like they were in the same room with me, you know? Um, so that in itself, instead of like me injecting, it was kind of like the energy was flowing in, if that makes sense at all. Totally. Yeah, totally, totally. And and obviously, uh, you know, Carmilla and Laura are the, the fulcrum by which the, you know, the story revolves around, but they are supported by uh, a cast of characters that are also uh, f not only fascinating, but very important to the story. Uh, would, would you guys mind, so like, if, if we start with Kathy and Dorothy, you guys assumedly had to spend a lot of time with one another uh, performing because your two characters are sort of tightly linked. Uh, tell me what what was it that you guys uh, felt like you needed to inject into the characters to sort of fill them out from the material of the book? Well, I'm going to be a Madame Peridon. Madame <laughs> Peridon, she, she, she's got a lot of secrets so that she can't uh, tell a lot of things in her life. Um, even where she says she's from, which that where she's from, who knows where she's really from. So <laughs> she appreciates secrets. She's brought up this woman that she loves so very, very much, who's been very wild as a child because she lost her mother. That's a terrible thing to lose your mother when you're very young. And she respects her secrets. She respects her space. She respects young love. She respects passion. Um, and she shares this respect with her lovely uh, other governess who is much more um, artistic. I'm more scientific. I care more about numbers with the, but Miss Jenna uh, Fontaine. Yes. Yeah, no, it, 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 uh, Sarah, Sarah, certainly for me, a lot of it came from working with this lady right here. Um, <laughs> It's one of these because they're the the kind of the um, the contrast couple for Carmela and Laura. A lot of a lot of adaptations, particularly the ones that want to do the whole oh no less no lesbians here, <laughs> that kind of De La Fontaine becomes um, she's kind of relegated to that kind of allo allo Yvette kind of character, which was fun for me because <laughs> he did that on stage, but. It, you can come at it at, and you want a little bit more than just a flirt in a corner. <laughs> so, but then gotcha. uh, the very first session was the, um, the exchange in the evening for us uh, between Paul and the two governesses initially. Um, and so the, get, getting her humor kind of unpin, underpinned it, this kind of, she, she's in that kind of interesting life space between kind of very naive, very kind of, sheltered ingenue kind of upbringing and this whole kind of oh wow there is this other woman who is like a my superior at work and different times so this is perfectly okay but you know this kind of full-grown woman who has just blown her sideways and in the middle is this kind of preformed family unit and it kind of was like putting on a good pair of socks wasn't it it was like kind of you just kind of go okay hang with these women and and kind of huh, okay, this is our family, and just kind of sit down into that. And a lot of it just came very organically out of there for me. And Dorothy is so charmingly funny. <laughs> I, I can tell. <laughs> it's three in the morning, you know. <laughs> 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 you laugh or you cry. <laughs> every now and then, every now and then in rehearsal, 
she was doing French, the French accents and little things, and suddenly changing words to their French equivalent. And it was absolutely marvelous most of the time, the vast majority of the time. But every now and then I had to tell her, we won't know what you just said. <laughs> 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 you know, like the way she pronounced T. I said, you're going to have to say T in the English way. I mean, not <laughs> Most people will be going, what? <laughs> just, just, but most of the time it was fantastic. An actor. So they've been kind of while I was running lines and I was doing this kind of very put on, very hello, hello kind of, uh, would you like to do tea? And he said, you know, it's got to be tea. It can't be tea. You can't do tea. I just can't. No, my mother will roll on her grave. No, you can't do tea. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, but they need it like this. So I'm just kind of, we had this kind of month of kind of my spouse in the background going kind of like, Ish. <laughs> you know, and, and, and like with the tea, David's saying to me, this is not a normal thing for you to do. You can't just be British and go, ha, something happened, I'm going to go and put the kettle on. <laughs> Which is kind of... Right, right. That's amazing. Excellent. Uh, so I was, I was blessed with this cast. I really was. <laughs> well, seriously, and I and I mean, uh, you know, obviously, uh, having listened to the first episode, there there is uh, quite a lot of Dorothy and Kathy's characters. There's also quite a lot of Paul's character as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and Paul, play, playing the father of Laura in this uh, in this production, you're kind of for the for the first part of the story, you're kind of the only dude uh, who we who we get to know at all. Um, yeah. Can Can you talk a little bit about sort of how you approach the character? Well, I tend to go top down, and that's one of the reasons I love David's work is that it has so many layers. Every character knows something and believes they know something else. And sometimes they're correct in that belief and it's a secret. Sometimes they're incorrect in that belief and they're clueless. Sometimes they think it's a secret, but others know. And just those layers of complexity are wonderful. For my character, Laura's father, it's a function of privilege that I think I know everything I need to know. And when I pretend something I don't know, that everyone has to get in line and pretend along with me. <laughs> and <laughs> as the master of the household, well, that's what the governesses and to some extent my wild child daughter have to do, get in line. But also my character is getting on in years and his hearing isn't quite so good and his eyesight isn't quite so good. So in his way, he lives in this bubble and he denies that there's anything other than total transparency to his bubble. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. That's, that's excellent. Was that fun? Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> Just finding all of these layers and secrets and cluelessnesses and <laughs> subtleties that, oh, he does know that, but he doesn't want anyone to know he knows that. Uh, ow. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, uh, so, so, David, coming back to you uh, real quick, the, the original you know, sort of the original novella is, it uh, feels like it's it's sort of a, almost an epistolary sort of, uh, you know, like you're reading Laura's diary. And uh, one of the things that I loved about this first episode was that you decided to kind of move to the side of that and keep Laura as the narrator, but you brought in this character of, uh, of Lady Har of a Fraulein Hartog, who I'm mm -hmm. assuming is related to the Baron Hartog in, in some way, and have her sort of interview Laura about the events of what took place. Well, actually, what I'm doing is going, I'm going back to the original novella because okay. this is not Laura's diary. It is her letter, a long letter she wrote in response to someone else. Gotcha. So this gotcha. is not thought, her own private thoughts. It is her relating what happened to someone who has an agenda. Gotcha. Uh, I just brought the person with the agenda on stage. Excellent. And so 
which indicates one of the things I think is very important to understanding about the novella. If you read it very carefully, the way people who would, if you know, you didn't have radio, television, the internet, or movies or anything like that in theater, if you're not, you know, in a major city, you're not going to get much theater. Um, people reread it very, very carefully, often aloud. Laura is what we would term an unreliable narrator. She's mm -hmm. not telling the truth completely. So that was the premise I was going from. But now the temptation is to, and most radio audio adaptations that you note this, what they do is they turn her into the narrator. On the, but if she's the narrator, then the assumption is she's telling the truth. I wanted to keep the idea and it didn't know. She's not telling the truth. And therefore, if she's not telling the truth, what is she hiding? Um, and from there, you get in the idea that uh, to me, uh, there's my favorite, one of my favorite bits in the play that is not heard by anyone except by someone who's reading the play is my description of Laura is a wild child who has learned how to pretend to be a doll. Oh, interesting. And so, yeah. Um, by the way, Hartog, uh, in the original novel, of course, there is no character named Hartog. That name uh, was lifted out of who knows how it was supposed to be Vordenberg, I presume, um, was put into the uh, uh, film, The Vampire Lovers. And that's With an that, Easter that egg. That great opening scene. That's just scene. it. Yeah, that's an <laughs> Easter egg. It's just that it's simple. Excellent. If I needed a name, okay, if, if, if we ever got into like her first name, it would be Ingrid for that very reason. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, Excellent. Probably. Wow. Yeah. I just, you know, it would, it's my little Easter egg to uh, that film version. Gotcha. Excellent. In, in terms of past uh, sort of adaptations, uh, do, I mean, we heard from Steppy and, and Brittany sort of what, you know, what their, what their research were. Dorothy, Kathy, Paul, did did you guys uh, did you guys go back and watch any uh, adaptations of Carmilla before approaching this role, or did you come into it cold? Speaking for myself, it seemed to me that David was going from the original source material, and so that's what I read and focused on to get a good sense of what did Lefanu do here, what were these characters in his conception. And then David's added layers of interpretation and added characters. Why did he add these characters? Why did this action get added? And I ignored all other interpretations. Perhaps, you know, I, don't, I don't know, perhaps because I'm a weak actor and I don't want to be corrupted <laughs> by other influences. No. <laughs> I doubt that's the case. But yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Kathy and Dorothy? I, I did a bit of sampling to hear what a few things sounded like. I did a bit of <laughs> paging through. Oh, there she is. And, and going, hmm, does this gel with what I have on my page? And I thought, no, no, no. I want to work on what I have on my page. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a vampire fan anyway. So I've, I've known the book and a couple of the versions before. I didn't specifically come back to them. But I was uh, really lucky. I was also working on a second show at the same time. And the team there are all either massive lesbian fiction fans or massive <laughs> vampire fans or both. <laughs> so, like, the minute we said Carmilla, they were like, laughing lesbian <laughs> vampires. And so we kind of, we had some kind of conversations on lunch, kind of, like, around kind of, what are you guys doing with it? And kind of, how deep does it go? And kind of, <laughs> you know. So that, that was really helpful to kind of have some other people for perspective. But I didn't kind of deep dive but again because it's so easy to get pulled off in another direction and having sure. play familiar like such a similar character i didn't want to kind of end up reprising her i wanted to do justice to madeleine sure sure yeah that totally makes sense uh so so just because just because uh, i'm curious uh would uh, if if i go around to each of each of you guys who performed in it uh, I just want to ask you, like, what what was your favorite moment in the in the production of doing this? And uh, let's let's go ahead and start with Steppy. 
Oh my. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot, a lot of great moments. Um, I try to decide what I want to say. Um, speaking to what I said earlier, there is one scene where we had a, a startlingly long conversation about what is Carmilla wearing in this scene? <laughs> Uh, really long. <laughs> yeah, it was um, just that was a pretty fun moment. Um, I'm honestly kind of blank because it was all like it was all really fun. It was all really great. Um, everybody just we were all having a blast there. But any particularly just from my perspective, the um, the scenes with um, Carmilla and Laura, like the very intimate uh, scenes where it's very clear that there's a very powerful connection there. We would have times where we would be really locked in. We would do the scene and then we would just have a lot of time left that we had scheduled. So Dave would say, okay, let's try it like this, try it like this, try it like this. And we, it was really fun and liberating to do that because we could just totally throw new things out and then eventually be like, okay, we have enough choices. And he ended up choosing, yeah, like the, the best ones from those. But um, I, I don't know why I'm like, I, I can't think of one particular moment. Um, it was all just really so great, but the, the intimate scenes between um, Carmilla and Laura are really just standouts. He would even like do the equivalent of a closed set where it would just be the three of us working, which felt really um, safe and you could really just get into it so much better. That's excellent. There were also a few times when I left yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> I said no for this bit. You just do, and I'll and you turn the video back on, and I'll come back. But uh, oh, yes. excellent, excellent. Yeah. So so just a just, just as a, a side off from that, David, how 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 difficult was it to go through and take so many different uh per, so many different performances and the different approaches and pick out the the versions that were going to become the final. The final play not as difficult as you might think because it becomes a very immersive process uh it just takes time quite a lot sure. of time and the other big headache being that nobody we weren't all in the same sound studio mm -hmm. and at various times uh in particular like even a couple of members of the cast their sound systems were very much at variance with everyone else's and that was the biggest headache of all that without that was just ugh. sure but and that's very kind of inescapable just yeah you just have to get format. around it one way or another partially that's one of the reasons to have the background sounds so every now and then you can just you know put in like the chime of a bell or uh, a a bird chirp or something or other to just cover over sure. some little thing that just sounds wrong uh but it's um I found mostly what uh, you, you think you might say, we'll take the best line from here and the best line from there and put them together. That very rarely works, mm -hmm. very rarely. Usually you have to get something that is just a flow. Uh, I th and you know, everybody else is, I'm eager to hear what everybody else says about their favorite bits. <laughs> All right, Brittany, let's, uh, let's hear from you next. Yeah, um, I can't just choose one moment, um, but I agree with Steppy, the whole intimate scenes, although I do have uh, some that I can go into detail with. Um, so like when I get her the ring, um, when, you know, just the images of like, everything's just coming back to me now. Um, the whole like translucent nightgown in the moonlight. And, um, you know, uh, when she, when I'm only gonna say like, when she bites me, that's it. You guys have to listen to everything else. Um, <laughs> But there was one scene in particular, though, that I do want to like dive a little bit into is that when she we're in the same room together and she kind of almost threatens to leave. Uh, and I'm like, oh, no, no, wait. But my dad and everybody's in the room and I can't, you know, it's almost like I'm, I'm grabbing at her and I can't say what I want to say. I can't express myself and all of these like bottled up feelings um, kind of like, oh, like I could just everything's just like coming back. But um, yeah, there's a scene where she uh, is like, oh, well, I'm gonna go, peace out. And I'm like, but no, 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 you can't go. And everybody's kind of like, yeah, no, you can't go. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly where it happens. I think it's in the beginning of the play, but um, yeah, about that's the middle. one of my favorites. I'm sorry? About the middle, and that's directly from the, from the novella. Yeah. That scene, yeah. Excellent. 
Excellent. Uh, Dorothy, how about yourself? I, oh, oh I got to pick now. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, like the whole thing, no word of a lie, was like master classes all through. I, you, you could not have been involved with this piece and not enjoyed it, but I think if I have to have just one, there is a scene towards the end um, between Kathy and myself. And, um, you know, there's this point where they curl up into bed together and they're reflecting on kind of everything that's happened. We're in that moment of, whoa, this big freaky weird thing just happened. And has it finished? Maybe it's finished. And it, and it, and it kind of it lined up so beautifully with where we are with the, like, you know, the pandemic continues. But right before, like, most places started going, we're going to pretend that didn't happen now. So there's like this kind of art mimics life. And at the same time, there's this nice kind of cuddly atmosphere. And David really helped us build the kind of that. And he's there going, I have, you know, I have rustling blankets for you and I have a fire. And we were just able to kind of play, weren't we? And, and, and be together. I think it took us like an hour to get that scene down. But mostly just because we were like paddling in it and just enjoying the time. And, and just, it's nice as well to kind of say goodbye bye to a character in that way because you especially character acting the, the kind of roles i get you don't often get to kind of have that kind of end punctuation point mm, so it's really mm -hmm. nice to mm. leave these two women kind of back in their kind of uh, old married couple kind of state with their blanket by the fire and and kind of just leave them there and what was okay. kind of fascinating about it was you moved about in the room. I, no, you were still, but I moved about in the room and approached and, and we were so far away. And yet you still felt like you were moving from a window, from a doorway to a window, to a bed, to in the bed, to next to someone's ear. And at that just... particular week, Kathy had 35 degree heat and I was here like pretty much like I am now in a blanket with snow <laughs> on the ground. We'd run out of oil that week, so I'm like, <laughs> oh you god, really cold. Is that? And, and that kind of it was weird, wasn't it? Because like real space fell away, and we were kind of we could have been face to face. It was fantastic. Which is again the Zoom world where we get to act together. Where when we, when we act together, Dorothy in person, person, who knows? Um, <laughs> which is so amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a very very special scene. And also because it's the kind of scene where you sit there and go, okay, well, let's write a story about these two ladies and what happens to them next. That's awesome. And that, that's what you feel like. That's awesome. So, so Kathy, would you, would, would that be your, your, uh, your moment that you wanted to talk about or was there another oh, absolutely. one? Uh, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. With characters that have such secrets, and how they unravel and how this is this beautiful unraveling of secrets that are totally forbidden in the society that are totally not known by the man who's running the household, which are right. probably known a little bit by the girl, but yeah, she probably shouldn't. It's just, she's awfully smart. <laughs> gotcha. So yeah, that was the best. Nice. And she has and a small Paul, world. Oh. She's very familiar with everything in it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Paul, what, what would you say was your favorite moment? Well, I have two answers, and I may ask that one of them be edited out. Let me see. Oh, excellent. With it. This, um, this sounds ooh. quite provocative. <laughs> Only because I tend not to disclose the personal in my life and my castmates and director have not heard this but um for a while i was a single dad my daughter lost her mom at an early age and as she grew up she was really bright and she lied to me all the time and i had a choice to make of either control or try to understand and love despite and I saw the character of Bennett as a man who took the other path than the one I took 
Um, so I see my relationship with Laura as the path avoided. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, sorry. No, no, that's that's beautiful. It really is. But somewhat related to that, um, this will, yes. So in the very first scene is the only time Mr. Bennett has any genuine mirth that <laughs> De La Fontaine is telling this story in her French accent. And oh, she's acting it as well. And I'm just sitting back in enjoying it so much <laughs> and then what do i do i puncture it you see my <laughs> to say why it's a ridiculous story and praising her and patting her on the head for yes yes good wind up doll you said the right thing and then moments later i get a letter with some tragic news and for the remainder of the radio play i'm not happy i don't have fun there is no mirth in me at all gotcha. so Gotcha. Excellent answers. Excellent. Um, so I, I learned a lot. Yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. Um, so having spoken with you guys now and, and heard your stories for the last 45 minutes or so, uh, I, I can't help but absolutely be in love with all of these characters and your interpretations of them. And I want to listen to the rest of the radio play. Now, mm -hmm. the first episode is up on YouTube, and mm -hmm. anybody can access it. And it's on, uh, the, your, your channel, David, is called Shadows on the Air? Yes. Excellent. And so, where can, so people should go and they, they should listen to this, this first episode. And then, mm -hmm. how many more episodes are there after this first one? Four. And where can people go to find those? Shadow, uh, patreon.com slash shadows on the air. Um, all you have to do is fork over $5 a month. You can cancel anytime you want. Uh, and you get uh, the link to where you can listen to the whole thing, uh, along with uh, a few other uh, video details. Um, the idea is shadows on the air is uh, my attempt to start putting together audio uh, gothic tales. I have several in mind. Um, I think the next one will be uh, an adaptation of, show, of a uh, an H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, that's a mini one. I also have, I would like to do an adaptation of The Great God Pan. Um, um, I would event, uh, I have hopes of one day adapting Varney the Vampire. Ooh! Not the whole that's thing. Only about that's five thousand pages long. Uh, yeah, it's 200, 200, <laughs> I'm assuming you would take an extract chapters. out of that. Uh, oh yes, I've already made plans. This whole thing is okay. Just chop this down and just turn it into you know one cohesive story that actually right. has its own thing. But it would be that would be a major undertaking because we're talking about more characters than Carmilla. For sure. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so that would be that would be more akin to an actual serial. That's we're kind of working our way up to that. Um, I am hoping, I am trying to get hold of the uh, to the estate of the late uh, great writer Tenneth Lee. I am wondering if I can try to have my uh, one of her. I think she wrote the greatest vampire short story I've ever read, and I would love to see if I could get the rights to adapt it. And it's okay. called Bite Me Not. Oh, interesting. Uh, I have not heard of this. You should definitely read it. It is an absolute, you know, she wrote two brilliant vampire short stories. One is Red as Blood, which is a retelling of Snow White. Oh, lovely. Her lips are vampire red as Snow blood. Vampire Snow White. I can get behind that. She definitely. sleeps in a coffin. So... And the other is Bite Me Not, which is entirely original. It basically involves uh, a great flock of vampires of the air that Ooh. are surrounding a castle Pretty. and trying to get in. 
This sounds lovely. And it, it sounds like excellent material for a radio play. I think so. I think so. It, it, I, it, it's, it's a challenge to see how to adapt to that one, but I really, really want a chance. But I can't do it without permission of Tenneth Lee's estate, which I keep trying to find. Um, gotcha. And so um, those are the ones I really uh, you know, have on the burner that I would like to do uh, in terms of Shadows on the Air. I do want to produce more materials uh, along these lines. And I yeah. love the fact that... Um, you know, you're you basically you you've made the rest of Carmilla available for essentially for five dollars. Like somebody could go sure. to Patreon, they could pay five bucks, and then they could hear the entire the entire production, sure. and cancel and say, okay, well, there you know the the creators have made some small amount of money, you know, for for their work and me listening to mm -hmm. it. But if they subscribe, and you know, just pay a little something every month that actually helps Shadows on the Air to make all this additional material sure. moving forward that you just told mm -hmm. us about. So yeah. that sounds like an excellent approach. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, okay, so, so I have one last question then uh, for you guys. Uh, the, in, in light of all of this, you guys have obviously put a lot of work into, into this production. Uh, and this channel is meant for people who are creators in the vampire genre who are working on their own stuff. What advice would you guys give, in any, in any order, uh, to somebody who is like, oh, maybe I want to do a radio play about vampires? Uh, what, would, what advice would you give to people about embarking on or executing on a radio play like this? The two things I would particularly note is one. The sound effects are absolutely key to creating an atmosphere. Creating that immersive world is vital, depending upon what you're going for, if you want terror, if you want mystery, whatever. The other is, and this is a problem I absolutely face because so many vampire stories are in some sense erotic. Okay foreplay is everything. <laughs> gotcha. Because gotcha. you can't do anything visual. Right. You can't show them kissing. You can't show, you know, um, uh, delicatage. You cannot show someone taking their clothes off. You cannot show lingering looks. It also has to be in terms of the talk, the interplay that is foreplay, if you're going to go in that direction at all. Keep it simple, simplicity works, and realize that when you do something that's for the ear, it's, it's, it's really close. So remember that it, the intimacy of, this, of the speech and the, when you're doing something that's to be listened to. I have two. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Uh, former hats, I, can't, I think you really, particularly for radio play you have to lean into or lean against you know a couple of years just before the pandemic there was this vogue creeping in of actors don't actually need a lot in given context given circumstances just fire them at it and leave them go no this this style directed david's done with us is much much and it sounds small it sounds finicky but knowing where the curtains are what they're made of every little last you know kind of inflection on that word so having that confidence to kind of go no these actors will receive this from me, need this from me. And then with my vampire lover hats, please, for the love of God, avoid the thing lately of kind of blunt object vampires. Uh, but not, explain, uh, please. Not sparkling, not misogynistic. <laughs> so <laughs> so you know, the, 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 the sparkle. Traditional. Yeah, the last kind of 10 years of vampires have not been our best vampires. We need really good, flawed, whole people. Superhuman people. In in the truest sense, not in the kind of the necessarily other sense that you see a lot of at the minute. I love it. I love it. Ex very poignant. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> I would say as creator, whether you're an actor, adapting or anything choose material you already really are passionate about 
Um, I've been personally, I've been passionate about Carmilla since I was 19. And um, I'm really glad that I was given the opportunity to play Carmilla 10 years later in, in this adaptation where it really aligned with my viewpoint of the story of, as I said at the beginning, Carmilla not being just evil for the sake of evil or just kind of one note. Um, if I had had an opportunity to play Carmilla earlier, that would have been really great initially, but if it wasn't kind of done with a lot of love behind it, I don't know if I would have been as proud or kind of given my best performance. So really choose a, um, a story or a storytelling method or a particular part of the lore that really attracts you to this genre, to this amazing genre, and go from there. And uh, I think it'll just be a lot more of an authentic rather than what you think people will want to hear in a vampire story, whether what you think audiences will like, time and time again as a creative, I've found when you do what you want to do, it just radiates and it shows. And I think that's why people respond so well to this adaptation, because we all love how it's done. We all love each other. We all love working on it. And it just shows. I guess if I had to give advice to everybody that's watching um, as an actor perspective, just create your characters with depth. Like, give us some layers. Give us something to like chew on and work on and figure it out. You know, um, don't give us all the answers all the time. Um, but yeah, and good luck. I would say if someone is going to do this, choose a director who wants perfection and will relentlessly keep at it and at it and at it. And at it. And at it. <laughs> is that describing David? His vision. No, no, no. I, 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 <laughs> Completely unrelated. <laughs> Until he actually gets his vision in audio form, if that's what his vision is, because there is something about, it's like a conductor. The conductor has a vision of what the performance should be, and over rehearsals will cause each of the instruments to blend, to enter, to prolong in his vision. And it's a unified vision. That's excellent. Okay, That's I want to add something to that as a warning. Yeah. As a warning. Yeah, okay. That director must also listen to the mm -hmm. cast, mm -hmm. must allow them their creative freedom. And in the process, we'll find new facets, new ideas, new depths within the story. Yes, there has to be a shared vision. Yes, it is a, you know, very much. Like, these actors can tell me one thing I kept asking over and over again. What are you trying to achieve when you say that line? And I did not, I hope, force a meaning, but just say, okay, this is what the line actually says. So what does it mean? And people came up with answers I had never thought of. It's always a dan you know, there is that Scylla and Charybdis thing of, yes, you need to pursue a particular vision, but you need to lead the way, not force the way. Gotcha. Excellent. Well That's said. my opinion. Well, guys, thank you very much for, uh, for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, I just want to go around real quick and ask each of you, where can people contact you or find you online if they want to reach out? Uh, and let's start with Dorothy. Um, dead easy, www.dorothylighty.com. All right, excellent. Kathy? Kathy Bill Denton at gmail.com, but I've also got a website, which is Kathy Bill Denton. <laughs> Is that a dot com or? Um, how do websites work? <laughs> when they're, they're just your name. <laughs> dot com. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> you just push them and they come up. <laughs> gotcha. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Paul? I don't have such a thing. So I guess I'm someone you pull rather than someone I push onto. <laughs> okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Steppy? You can find me on Instagram at some laughing ghosts, all one word. I have a link tree there. It's a quote from a Twilight Zone episode. The tree. <laughs> um, for the link tree, my okay. Instagram, where you can find my, my projects, including my current project where I play Sylvia Plath. Um, you can also, if you want to email me, you can email me at Kame, my last name, creates at gmail.com. Excellent. Excellent. And Brittany? 
Uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Brittany DeLeon underscore, um, or you can visit me on my website where you can know my entire life, uh, www.BrittanyDeLeon.com, and that's B-R-I-T-T-N-E-Y. Um, no A's, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And David? DavidMcDowellBlue.com. Okay. Excellent. And by the and way, if, people... if you need to get to home with, if you need to get contact with Paul, contact me. I will be glad to support <laughs> your Oh, perfect. Excellent. You can, you can act as, he's a as, marvel, as his manager. He's a marvelous that's, that's actor. He's a marvelous actor. And I totally understand why you would want to use him. <laughs> perfect. For everybody out there, uh, he's very good. And he's also a delightful person to work with. All right. And if people want to watch at least the first episode of this, they can find it on YouTube uh, on Shadows on the Air is the name of the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, otherwise, guys, thank you so very much for, for talking to us today. And, uh, and thank you very much for this adaptation of Carmilla. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us this thank opportunity. You. Oh man, that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, I really a uh, couple things struck me there. One, it's fascinating to me that uh, in directing a Zoom play, David had to uh, almost kind of act like a dungeon master in a lot of ways, uh, describing to all the players, you know, here's where you are. This person moves over to this side of the room. This person walks outside the castle. This is what you hear in the distance. Like, it it really sort of just kind of stepped over that line of, uh, you know, stage play into sort of role-playing game techniques there for, for a minute. So that was really fascinating. Um, I was also, like, something that, that Dorothy said that really struck me was uh, the, the fact that Zoom is now this sort of watershed moment in theater. She has, uh, like, the number of roles that she's taken have just, like, increased exponentially since the pandemic started because of... Uh, the you know the this this now this sort of this new offspring of theater that is that is Zoom theater. So this is this is really interesting to me. Um, so for any of you out there who you know watch some of this and were like, oh you know what I wonder I wonder if a Zoom play is the kind of creative outlet that I need. I mean it's certainly something that got me thinking. So. Uh, anyway, please go and check out uh, the the entirety of the Carmilla radio play. I'll put a link to the first episode on YouTube and a link to the Patreon so that you can go and check out the rest of it. And I kind of like this idea of sort of like the five dollar ticket to get to see or to to see and listen to the rest of the play. It's uh, you know I like being able to support artists who are making stuff on YouTube and just on the web uh, and they're putting it out there, uh, you know, their blood, sweat, and tears. I like to be able to give them a little something back and so I, I patron a number of artists who I really like. And in this particular case, I love that it's, you can go and you can just pay $5 to just see the whole thing if you want and then hit cancel or you can just, uh, you know, make it a regular monthly thing, and then you're supporting more of this stuff being made. So, so definitely go and check that out. That's it for this week. Uh, I Lucy X Mina is out to a number of film festivals, so as I hear back from that, I will let you know. I give this plug at the end of almost every episode, but but here I, I think it's it's uh, more justified than usual in that if you are a creator who is working on your own vampire stuff we have a lot of videos that might be helpful to you. So anything under the playlist entitled Your Vampire Project, I think will be of interest to you. But anyway, that's it. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.